1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 29 through 31. That no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. The Apostle Paul wrote uh, this letter to Christians living in a part of the world where human wisdom was highly esteemed. As Paul notes in verse 22 of the same chapter, the Greeks sought after wisdom. Corinth was not far from Athens, a city which was for many ages the most famous center of philosophy and learning in the world. But Paul points out to the Christians in Corinth that the gospel of Jesus Christ had destroy the wisdom of the world and brought it to nothing. The learned Greeks and their philosophers had not come to know God through their wisdom, nor were they able to discover the truth of the things of God. But when these men had done their best and failed, it pleased God at last to reveal himself by the very gospel which the Greeks despised as foolishness. Paul explains that God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things that are despised, yea, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. And the Apostle tells his readers why God did this in these words, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Notice here two things. One, what God aims at in the manner in which he orders and carries out our redemption, but man should not glory in himself, but in God alone. This is stated in verses 29 and 31, that no flesh should glory in God's presence, that as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. Two, how this end is achieved in the work of redemption, by the ordering that men should be absolutely and universally dependent upon God for all their good and redemption. This dependence upon God is seen first in all that in all that the good of the redeemed is in and through Christ, as Paul says in verse thirty. Christ is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. All the good of the fallen and redeemed creature is concerning these four things. But Christ is each of them to us. And we have none of them if we have them not in him. He made unto us wisdom, Paul says. A true understanding of God is granted and gained in Christ alone, the light of the world. So also, Paul tells us, it is in and by Christ that we have righteousness. For it is in him that we are justified, have our sins pardoned, and are received as righteous into God's favor. To this Paul adds that it is in Christ that we have sanctification, meaning true holiness or uprightness of heart, and so inherent as well as imputed righteousness. And finally Paul states that it is in Christ that we have redemption or the actual deliverance from all misery and the bestowment of all happiness and glory. Thus, in these four words, we ought to see that we have all our good in Christ, who is God. Secondly, we further see that man is dependent upon God for all his good in redemption, in that it is God who has given us Christ, the one in whom we have all these benefits of redemption. So Paul says in verse 30 that Christ of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness. And thirdly, man's dependence upon God for all his good and redemption appears in that it is of God that we are in Christ Jesus and have come to have an interest in him and so receive those blessings which he made unto us. That is, it is God who gives us the faith that brings us to be united to Christ our Savior. Thus, in this verse, we are shown our dependence upon each person in the Trinity for all our good in redemption. We are dependent upon Christ, the Son of God, as he is our wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. We are dependent upon God, the Father, in that He is it is he who has given us Christ, the Son, and made him to be these things for us. 
And we are dependent upon God, the Holy Spirit, for it is of Him that we are in Christ Jesus. That is to say, it is the Spirit that gives us faith in Him, that faith whereby we receive Christ and close with Him. So, through the exposition of this passage of Scripture, we arrive at this doctrine. God is glorified in the work of redemption in this, that there appears in it so absolute and universal a dependence of the redeemed upon God. I'll repeat that. The, the doctrine stated is, God is glorified in the work of redemption in this, that there appears in it so absolute and universal a dependence of the redeemed upon God. So here I propose to, to show two things. That there is an absolute dependence and universal dependence on the redeemed upon God for all their good. And secondly, that God is in this manner exalted and glorified in the work of redemption. So first, there is an absolute and universal dependence of the redeemed on God. The nature and arrangement of our redemption is such that the redeemed are in everything directly, immediately, and entirely dependent on God. That is to say, they are dependent on Him for all and are dependent on Him in every way. We may state the case this way. They have all their good of Him. They have all their good through Him. And they have all their good in Him. When we say that they have all their good of Him, we mean He is the cause and the original source from whom all good comes. And when we say that they have all their good through Him, we mean that He is the medium by which all their good is obtained and conveyed to them. And when we say that they have all their good in Him, we mean that He is the good itself, which is given to and received by them. So those that are redeemed by Jesus Christ do, in all these respects, very directly and entirely depend on God for their all. Let us first consider that the redeemed have all of their good of God. God is the great author of redemption. And this can be seen in several ways. First, it is of God that we have our Redeemer. For God gave us Jesus Christ. He chose and anointed Him, appointed Him to His work, and sent Him into the world for us. And not only has God given this Redeemer for us, but it is God also who accepts Him for us, His life for ours, that we might not die but live. It is also of God that we are brought to Christ our Redeemer, and of God that we are united to Him. For that faith wherein we receive Christ is of God. So Paul in Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Furthermore, it is God who also gives us all the benefits of redemption that Christ has purchased for us at the cross. God gives us justification. And so saves us from the guilt of sin, forgiving us for Christ's sake, and snatching us from hell to be received into his favor into heaven. God sanctifies us and so delivers us from the dominion of sin, liberating and cleansing our hearts from all evil and filthiness of it, that we might walk as new men in paths of righteousness. These benefits of redemption God imparts to us through the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit is himself God. God sends God to give us, in Christ, the knowledge of God, the moral character of God, and upholds us in the same. And lastly, though means are used in conferring grace to men's souls, yet it is of God that we have the means of grace, and it is He that makes them effectual. It is of God that we have holy scriptures. They are His Word. It is of God that we have ordinances, and their efficacy depends on the immediate influences of His Spirit. The ministers of the Gospel are sent of God, and all their sufficiency is of Him. So Paul admits in 2 Corinthians 4.7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Their success as preachers depends entirely and absolutely on the immediate blessing and influence of God. The truth is that all the good of the redeemed is of the grace of God who redeems them. 
In fact, it was of glorious and infinite grace that God gave us His only begotten Son, for the Son is an infinitely great person, infinitely precious and glorious, infinitely near and dear to God. The gift of redemption in Him is doubly great in that we are delivered from an infinite and eternal misery to receive an infinite and eternal joy and glory. Furthermore, Christ is given to those infinitely unworthy of Him who instead of deserving Him merit infinite wrath at the hands of God. And the manner in which Christ was given to us is wonderfully gracious, seeing the humiliation and expense endured that we might have Him. God gave Him to us incarnate, in our nature, though without sin, in a low and afflicted state, to be a last slain, a sacrificial feast of divine love and redemption for our wretched souls. In all these ways, the grace of God to us in redemption appears truly and wonderfully gracious indeed. The grace of God in redemption is also most free. That is, not something which God has compelled or coerced us to do. God is no, under no obligation to redeem. He might have rejected fallen man as he did the fallen angels. Never have we merited God's redemption. It was decreed and begun while we were his enemies and before we had so much as repented. Redemption was from the love of God when there was no beauty in us to attract that love, nor did he ever expect to be repaid for his love. And it is from the mere grace of God that the benefits of Christ are applied to particular persons in redemption. Those who are called and sanctified are to attribute their good estate to the good pleasure of God's goodness alone. And it is by that goodness alone that they are distinguished from others. All the good of the redeemed is not only all of God's grace, but also of God's power. The great power of God in redemption appears in bringing a sinner from his low state, from the depths of sin and misery, to such an exalted state of holiness and happiness. So Paul in Ephesians, the first chapter, verse 19, says, What is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the work of his mighty power? We are dependent on God's power through every step of our redemption to convert us, to give us faith in Jesus Christ, and to impart to us a new nature of holiness. Redemption is said in the Bible to be a work of creation. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. From 2 Corinthians 5.17 And we are created in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2.10 the fallen creature cannot attain to true holiness except by being created again. So Paul in Ephesians 5.24 says, And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Redemption is a raising from the dead, wherein also ye are risen with him through faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. In fact, the conversion of a sinner is a more glorious work of power than mere creation or raising a dead body to life, in that the effect attained is greater and more excellent. That holy and happy being and spiritual life which is produced in the work of conversion is far greater and of more glorious effect than mere being and life. And the state from which the change is made a death in sin, a total corruption of nature, and depth of misery is far more remote from the state attained than mere death or non-existence. It is by God's power also that we are preserved in a state of grace. So in 1 Peter, the first chapter, verse 5, we hear, Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation? As grace is at first from God, so it is continually from Him and is maintained by Him as much as light in the atmosphere is all day long from the sun as well as at the first dawning of the sunrise. Men are dependent on the power of God for every exercise of grace and for carrying on that work in the heart 
for subduing sin and corruption, increasing holy principles, and enabling the heart to bring forth fruit in good works. Man is dependent on divine power in bringing grace to its perfection and making the soul completely amiable in Christ's glorious likeness in filling it with a satisfying joy and blessedness. In raising the body to life again into such a perfect state that it shall be suitable for a habitation and organ for a soul so perfected and blessed. Greater even than his making man a holy creature in the beginning, now God exhibits a more glorious work of power in renewing and upholding a fallen soul in a state of grace and holiness, carrying it on until it is brought to glory. Since there is so much sin remaining in the heart resisting and Satan with all his might opposing this change. These are the most glorious effects of the power of God upon men of redemption. So, having seen that the redeemed have all their good of God, let us now proceed to see that they also have all their good through God. God is the medium of redemption as well as the author and fountain of it. All we have wisdom, the pardon of sin, deliverance from hell, acceptance into God's favor, grace and holiness, true comfort and happiness, eternal life and glory is from God by a mediator, and this mediator is God, on whom we have an absolute dependence. And all is received through Him. This is an amazing thing, that God not only gives us the mediator and accepts His mediation, and of His power and grace bestows things purchased by the mediator, but the mediator is God. This means that in redemption, God is both the purchaser and the price. For Christ, who is God, purchased these blessings of redemption for us by offering up Himself as a price of our salvation. He purchased eternal life by the sacrifice of Himself. So in Hebrews 7.27, we read, He offered up Himself. And also, in the book of Hebrews 9.26, He hath appeared to take away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. True, it was his human nature which Christ offered at the cross, but still it was the same person with the divine nature and therefore an infinite price, God the Son being offered for our salvation. Before his fall into sin, man being made in God's image possessed an original righteousness, which was his own. But now, as a redeemed sinner, the righteousness of man is and only can be the righteousness of Christ, the mediator. And in this way, we are entirely dependent upon Him for our salvation. And He is God, so we are dependent upon righteousness, the righteousness of God, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Thus, in redemption, we have not only all things of God, but also by and through Him, as the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians 8.6, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him, and the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him. Finally, under this heading, we have seen that the redeemed have all of their good of God and through God, so let us also observe that they also have all of their good in God. God is all of our good, The good of the redeemed may be either objective or inherent. Their objective good being that good thing that is outside of themselves, which when they possess and enjoy it, makes them happy. And their inherent good would be the excellency or pleasure in themselves or in their own souls, which makes them happy. And God is both to the redeemed. He is their happiness, whether considered as their objective, outside their self, or inherent, inside themselves. First, the redeemed have all of their objective good in God. God himself is the great good, which through redemption they are brought to possess and enjoy. God himself is the highest good and the sum of all good which Christ purchased at the cross. God is the inheritance of the saints, the portion of their souls. God is their wealth, their treasure, their food, their life, 
their dwelling place, their ornament, and diadem, and their everlasting honor and glory. They have none in heaven but God. He is the great good which the redeemed are received to at death, and to which they are to rise at the end of the world. The Lord God is the light of the heavenly Jerusalem, the river of the water of life that runs there, and the tree of life that grows in the midst of the paradise of God. The glorious excellencies and beauty of God will be what will forever entertain the minds of the saints, and the love of God will be their everlasting feast and consolation. The redeemed will indeed enjoy other things. They will enjoy the angels. They will enjoy one another. But that which they shall enjoy in the angels and in each other, or in anything whatsoever, they will give them delight and happiness in what shall be seen of God in these things. God is all their objective good. And secondly, the redeemed have all their inherent good in God. Inherent good is twofold. It is either excellency or pleasure. But of, the, but of these, the redeemed derive not only from God as being caused by them, but have in him as the excellency and pleasure of their souls. The redeemed have spiritual excellency and joy by a kind of participation of God. They are made excellent by a communication of God's excellency. God puts his own beauty, that is, his beautiful likeness upon their souls. God, he, he makes us partakers of the divine nature of his moral image. 2 Peter 1.4 They are holy because they are made partakers of God's holiness. Hebrews 12.10 The saints are beautiful and blessed by a communication of God's holiness and joy as the moon and planets are bright by the sun's light. The saints have spiritual joy and pleasure by a kind of effusion of God on the soul. And in these things the redeemed have communion with God. That is, they partake with him and they partake of him. The saints have this inherent spiritual excellency and blessedness by the gift of the Holy Spirit in that he gives himself to them, becoming an inhabitant to the soul of the redeemed and a vital principle living there. He, acting in, upon, and with the soul, becomes a fountain of true holiness and joy, as a spring is of water by the exertion and diffusion of itself. So Jesus said to the woman at the well in John 4:14, 4, "But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give shall be a well of water springing up unto everlasting life." And at the feast of the tabernacles in John 7:38-39, "He that believeth on me, as the scriptures hath said, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water." But this he spoke of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. The sum of what Christ has purchased for us is that spring of water, those rivers of living water spoken of in these places. And the sum of the blessings which the redeemed shall receive in heaven is the river of water of life that proceeds from the throne of God and the Lamb in Revelation 2.1, which is doubtless uh, this, the same thing signified in those rivers of living water mentioned in John's Gospel and elsewhere called the river of God's pleasures. Herein consists the fullness of the good which the saints receive of Christ. Partaking of the Holy Spirit, they have communion with Christ in his fullness. God has given the Spirit, not by measure unto him, and the redeemed to, to receive his fullness in grace for grace. This is the sum of the saints' inheritance, and therefore that little of the Holy Spirit which believers have in this world is said to be the earnest of the inheritance in the next, 2 Corinthians 1.22. So the full effusion of the Spirit upon the redeemed and the full indwelling of the Spirit in their souls is the sum of the blessings that Christ died to procure and the subject of all gospel promises. Likewise, in Galatians 3.13-14, we hear that he was made a curse for us, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The Spirit of God is the great promise of the Father. As Christ said to his disciples in Luke 24, 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. The Spirit of God is therefore called 
the spirit of promise, also in Ephesians 1.13. This promised blessing Christ received and had given into his hand, and soon as he finished the work of our redemption to bestow on all that he had redeemed, so Peter of the Spirit at Pentecost said, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he hath shed forth this, which ye both see and hear. So in this way, all the holiness and happiness of the redeemed, both here and hereafter, is not only of God and through God, but it is also in God. He is the author of redemption and the Redeemer. And their redemption is of all his grace and power, his purchase and mediation and the communication of himself unto their souls as their good. So it is that the scriptures declare of God, or of him and through him and to him are all things. What remains to be shown, then, is that God is glorified in the work of redemption in this way. Namely, that there is so great and universal a dependence upon the redeemed, upon him. Naturally, we tend to observe and notice that which concerns us most. There is nothing which concerns us more than that upon which we utterly depend. So the more a person finds himself concerned with and dependent upon the power and grace of God, the greater occasion he has to take notice of that power and grace. Likewise, the greater and more absolute his dependence on the divine perfections belonging to the three persons of the Trinity the greater his occasion to observe and own the divine glory of each of them. Those things that we are not much dependent upon are easy to neglect. But we can scarce do any other than mind that which we have great dependence upon. Being so wholly dependent in redemption upon God and his perfections, he and his glory are more directly set in our view whichever way we turn our eyes. We will take greater notice of God's all-sufficiency when all our sufficiency is thus in every way in him as an infinite good and the fountain of all our good. To the degree that man depends upon God, to the same degree does man's emptiness in himself appear. And the greater man's emptiness, the greater must be the fullness of the being who supplies his wants or his lacks. Our having... All of God shows the fullness of his power and grace. Our having all through him shows the fullness of his merit and worthiness. And our having all of him demonstrates his fullness of beauty, love, and happiness. And the redeemed, by reason of the greatness of their dependence on God, have not only a greater occasion, but a greater obligation to contemplate and acknowledge the glory and the fullness of God as their all-sufficient Redeemer. How unreasonable and ungrateful should we be if we did not acknowledge that sufficiency and glory which we absolutely, immediately, and universally depend upon. Such a great and universal dependence upon God shows as well how much greater God's glory is than man's. There is a great distance between the Redeemer and the redeemed. Man being in every way dependent upon God as his Redeemer, so man appears as nothing in redemption, while God is all. Where man is not made sensible of the fact that he in his pride is not disposed to give God the glory which is truly and rightly due unto him. Thus, what God aims at in the disposition of redemption, if we allow the scriptures to be a revelation of God's mind, is that God should appear full and man empty. That God should appear all and man nothing. It is God's declared design that none should glory in his presence And to that degree that man does glory in the presence of God, in that same degree, God is robbed of the glory which he seeks in his redemption, if man does not. Having ordered that we should have so absolute and universal a dependence upon God of redemption, so God claims our whole souls as the redeemed, and our undivided respect and gratitude. Were we partly to depend upon God and partly on something else? either ourselves or something other, then our respect and gratitude would be divided between these two benefactors. But now there is no occasion for this, God being he of whom, through whom, and in whom we are redeemed. So that whatever there is to attract our respect and gratitude and redemption, 
still we find that ultimately and at last it is God, the all in all, to whom alone honor and thanksgiving is due. Consider now these several uses of this doctrine, of the application of the doctrine. First, let us appreciate that those doctrines and schemes of divinity that are in any respect opposite to such an absolute and universal dependence on God derogate from his glory and thwart the design of our redemption. And such are those schemes that attribute to man what belongs to God in any of the ways mentioned and so elevate man into a place of either Father, Son, or Holy Spirit in anything pertaining to our redemption. However, they may teach a great dependence of the redeemed on God, yet it should be seen that they deny a dependence of God that is so absolute and universal. Some affirm a dependence on the Father for the great plan of redemption, but leave it in the hand of man to determine whom the Father will be allowed to redeem. Some affirm a dependence on the Son for the great purchase of redemption, but leave it in the hand of man to secure that purchase and the benefits of it by a sovereign act of the sinner's will. Some affirm a dependence on the Holy Spirit for the stirring of interest in Christ as he preached in the gospel, but leave it in the hand of man to generate that faith wherein he is brought and united to Christ at last. Now, whatever scheme is inconsistent with our entire dependence on God for all and having all of him, through him, and in him, it is repugnant to the design and tenor of the gospel and robs it of that which God accounts its luster and its glory. Secondly, let us see that this is why God redeems men through faith. Because faith is a sensible acknowledgement of absolute dependence upon God in this affair. It is fitting that it should be required of all who would be redeemed that they should be sensible of and acknowledge their dependence upon God for it. By this means, God has arranged to glorify himself in redemption And he ought to at least have this glory of those that are the subjects of redemption and the beneficiaries of it. Faith is a sensibleness of what is real in the work of redemption, and the soul that believes sees that it really depends on God for all salvation. It is man coming as a child, humbled and abased, sensible of being, wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, needing God, his mercy, his power, his love for all. So it must be if God is to hit that at which he aims in redemption. So the language of faith is and must be not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to thy name give glory. And finally, let us now be exhorted to exalt God alone and to ascribe to him the glory, all the glory of redemption. Let us endeavor to obtain and increase in a sensibleness of our great dependence upon God, to have our eye to Him alone, to mortify a self-dependent and self-righteous disposition. Man is proud and would exalt himself through a dependence on his own power or goodness for his, resen- for his redemption. He is prone to have respect to the enjoyments alien from God and His Spirit and those in which happiness is to be found. But this doctrine should teach us to exalt God alone as by trust and reliance, so by praise. Let him that glorieth, glorieth in the Lord. Has any man hoped that he is converted and sanctified, and that his mind is endowed with true excellency and spiritual beauty? That his sins are forgiven, and he is received into God's favor, and exalted to the honor and blessedness of being his child and heir to the exalted life. Then let him glory, give glory, to God, who alone makes him to differ from the worst of men in this world or the most miserable of the damned in hell. Has any man much comfort and strong hope of eternal life? Let not his hope lift him up, but dispose him the more uh, to abase himself, to reflect on his own exceeding unworthiness of such favor, and to exalt God alone. And is any man eminent in holiness holiness and abundant in good works? Then, by all means, let him 
take nothing of the glory of it himself, but ascribe it to all him who is the the workmanship we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works.